you know, hopefully we'll get the hang of it. Um, okay, uh, so the assessment, we're working on grading it. Uh, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, has, yeah, see me after class if you have not submitted the assessment for any reason. Um, and just make sure we have a plan for you uh, for going forward. Um, you should have gotten your team assignments. We talked about that. Um, and we got a little bit behind uh, on kind of the lectures and where kind of where assignments are going to fall, that kind of thing. So I need to update the syllabus to fix that. So just I'll post a note to Piazza, but just keep in mind the syllabus is going to get changed a little bit, not too much. Basically, a couple of things will get shifted out. Um, Assignment two should go out hopefully later today. Maybe it might be tomorrow, but hopefully later today. Uh, it will be due next Tuesday. Um, but it's it should be pretty short and sweet. The first thing you're going to do is uh, you're going to, as a team, uh, develop a problem statement. Hopefully between now and next Tuesday, you'll have your first team meeting uh, and you can maybe work on it during that team meeting uh, or meet you know independently, uh, but to try to come up with a problem statement. Um, and we're going to talk about more what those are in a minute. Uh, and then you also should be getting started on your backlog. We're going to talk about what that is in a minute. Um, and the assignment, though, is to basically give me a link to your backlog and have some content in it. OK, uh, but it doesn't have to be a huge amount, just a little bit. So what else? Yeah. All right. Is it not? It's still there. 8442. It's just very, very small. Um, all right, any other questions? Cool. So um, we talked about agile methods and waterfall methods, uh, you know, some, some lecture before today. Uh, and we talked about a bunch of different things. However, for this class, we're gonna be using Scrum. So I'm gonna dive into that a little bit more, okay? Um, so first and foremost, uh, did we talk about what a product owner is? Does anybody know what a product owner is? Okay, so the product owner is the person who is responsible for the product, okay? And what that means is they usually have, hope, or let's say, I'm gonna put hopefully in front of all of these things, but they should have a relationship with your customers of whatever that product is. And when I say customer, I mean, it can be anything. It doesn't, it could be a nonprofit. It could be, you know, whatever the product is, it still has customers, right? In other words, like users, right? So whoever's using that software is a customer. Um, and so they could be internal users, right? It could be external users, lots of different ways they could be. Um, but the product owner is responsible for making sure they have enough meetings with those people. So they understand what they're looking for out of the product. They also have meetings with other kinds of stakeholders, right? Because somebody's got to pay for you to develop the product, right? So they might have meetings with some sort of executive staff that uh, you know keeps track of their budget and makes sure that there's money coming in. Um, well, that's sometimes in project manager as well. But so the product owner, short answer, forget the stuff about the budget stuff as much. But typically, they own the product. So as a result, they're the one who is driving what's the next feature that's going to get built and released and things like is it a higher priority to fix this bug or to work on this feature or fix this bug versus that bug okay so they're the ones who's responsible for that and that's the product owner um they usually communicate this particularly in scrum through what's called a product backlog or a backlog and what that is is just the set of things that need to be done someday for the product or project, right? But for the product that they want to deliver. Um, and they should be in some kind of order and that order should be prioritized, okay? So the stuff, usually it's like the boards I showed you before, the stuff that's at the top is the highest priority, the stuff that's at the bottom is the lowest priority. Oh, look at that. Uh, Top Hat did a great job on dealing with my uh, transitional slides. Um, Shoot, I am definitely having an awesome day today. Um, I really expected to be able to handle it. Uh, so 
for these couple slides. All right, so sprint planning and sprint backlog. Okay, and so what you do is you have this product backlog, which is separate and distinct from the sprint backlog. So the product backlog is everything you ever want to build for this product. Okay, and how complete that is is largely up to the team and the product owner. So uh, I work with product owners who want to have every single idea they've ever had in the product backlog. But I've also worked with ones where they only want to keep ideas that are like relevant soon. Okay. And the two schools of thought there are every idea ever. Okay. So we don't lose any. And the other one is you won't lose the idea if it's actually good. Okay. So uh, I actually tend to favor through many times of being in the first type of doing every single thing or listing every single thing, I am now much more in favor of the only, only list the things that are sued. You throw out the rest. If they continue to be worthwhile, you'll remember them. You'll bring them back. They will make it back in when they are on the kind of event horizon. Does that make sense? But you got to, you know, as software engineers, as, you know, developers, as, you know, docs, UX, whatever, people working on the project, Product, the product owner is the one that gets to decide. So they tell you what way this is going to work. So that's the product backlog. The sprint backlog, however, is what you're planning on doing this sprint. And that should be it. Okay. And the way you figure out what you should be doing in this sprint is through a sprint planning meeting. So here, you take in the sprint planning meeting, you take the product backlog. Uh, sometimes the product owner is in this meeting, sometimes they rely on their backlog being ordered correctly. Um, and basically you pick off the things that are both high priority, but also things that the team feels like they can do in that sprint. Okay. Uh, and then they basically develop the sprint backlog as, you know, copy from product to sprints. Okay. Um, and then also this backlog should also have a priority. Um, usually we'll reflect that one, but not all. Um, and then basically the scrum team, uh, you know, goes and works on it. Okay. But every day they have what's called the daily scrum or the daily standup. Uh, and you ask three questions. One is, um, uh, what did you do yesterday? Basically, what are you doing today? And what, what do you need for help? Okay. Um, so that the whole team can be aware of what you're working on and what you recently worked on. And this, I think, seems to a lot of people um, as kind of a waste of time. Because it's like, why do I care what you worked on yesterday? Well, the reason I care, even though we're working on completely different features, is because sometimes there are synergies there, right? Sometimes I hear you just, you know, you're about to work on blah, blah, blah. And I can say, wait, I just did that. Or I did it under a different name. Why don't we just, you know, et cetera. <coughs> so, <excuse me. coughs> um, so it's a way to make sure the team actually knows what the team is doing. Um, I don't know why the word increment is here, whatever. Um, but so you do uh, basically at the end of every sprint. Um, and so they call it a sprint review here. Uh, and this is actually a scrum.org. So they're supposed to be the ones who know. I usually call it demo. Um, and the reason I make the distinction is because I believe that at the end of every sprint, every member of the team should demo some or all of the stuff they did in the sprint. Okay. And when I say demo, I mean in production or near as production as possible. Sometimes you have sprints that are like, or like, you know, my portion of the sprint, right? Might be writing a doc, or it might be doing what's called a spike. A spike is basically research to figure out how to do some other thing. Okay. So like, like we have a spike that says, should we choose actually for the uh, InfoNOMS project, um, which, uh, what's the word? Uh, I completely like proxy. Uh, so there's a bunch of different proxy servers. That project needs a proxy server. A spike might be to investigate what proxy server is the best one to use. Um, and so I developed that uh, for that sprint. And then maybe a following sprint is actually implement the proxy, right? Yeah. I have no idea. 
to be honest. I, and I think it's really ludicrous, but it's like pervasive. Um, so yeah, ask the internet. I, I don't know. It's one of those things I keep thinking I should look up one of these days and never do. Um, so, okay, so demo at the end of every sprint. I strongly encourage it. It is a very good practice. Uh, it really does make a lot of difference in basically, you know, some of the relatedness stuff we talked about because you see other people's work. Um, it makes people feel good to be able to show off their stuff. It makes people understand that error is and failure is part of the process. Because sometimes for a sprint demo, I've just shown how badly everything blew up for me. Okay. And that is a perfectly valid demo. So it's, it really does have a lot of benefits. Then I wouldn't necessarily say every sprint, but most sprints, you'll have a sprint retrospective. What went right? What didn't go right about the sprint? You know, did we choose too much for our sprint backlog? Did we not transition well between team members? Did, um, did we not write enough documentation? Did we not plan enough effort, et cetera, et cetera? So this is a scrum plan. Probably all on the second plot. Yeah, yeah. So the whole the whole point of transition was pointless. Um, oh, I did miss one thing. So does anybody know what a scrum master is? So basically, a scrum master is kind of like a project manager. Okay, and and I want you to note when I say project manager versus product manager or product owner. The project manager, you know, runs the project. They, in some ways, don't actually care what the application is. They're in charge of timelines and deliverables and making sure, you know, you follow company processes. And often, this is why I got messed up on saying budget, often responsible for budget, things like that. Scrum Master is similar, um, except not actually. So the Scrum Master in some organizations is kind of a project manager and kind of a Scrum Master wearing the same, you know, two different hats, same person. But the Scrum Master really should be responsible for kind of managing the, the what they call the ceremonies of your Scrum process, okay? So they run the retrospective, right? They poke people and make sure everybody contributes to the retrospective. They run that demo day review type thing, right? They, um, they run the planning meeting. Um, and often when a team really gets rolling, so if you're working on a project for let's say six months, you might have a scrum master for the first month while you really get the hang of what you're doing. Then they just kind of go away. Um, and then you kind of keep doing it. And maybe they check back in at month three and make sure things are going well still. Um, but so it's kind of like the person who's responsible for teaching you how to scrum rather than uh, necessarily a part of the team. So in that, in, and so there's a lot of similarities with project manager because the project manager will often work the same way. Um, yeah, there you go. Make sense? Okay. Um, so on your teams, the kind of person that's on your team that is not in this room is a project manager. So they don't, they're, they're responsible for working with the partner and the client, working through our organization and making sure, you know, you have what you need, uh, you know, from a software, hardware, that kind of perspective, all those kinds of things. So more like logistics. Um, if you have a technical question, you should come to us, okay? Like me or Matt or whatever, but not the PMs, okay? They may know the answer. And if you ask them, it's not the end of the world. But generally speaking, what you want to be doing is talking to us. Um, I just realized I forgot to show the screen in the video. Let me just fix that real quick. Um, so, yeah, so that's what the project manager does. Uh, and, you know, at least in the role they're playing uh, for your projects. Okay. Um, and they'll usually, they'll usually agree uh, with those things. All right, let me try finding my mouse. I don't think I have any more transition slides, so let me go to this one. All right, so yeah, with uh, basically, uh, this is basically what I said. It's kind of another graphic showing the same thing. Um, I added a lot more graphics to this uh, slide deck, so it's uh, a little bit of a work in process. Um, wait, what? 
Oh. Yeah, I'm just having an awesome day today. Uh, where did the... Uh, really? There it is. I was driving the wrong presenter view. Um, so this is just kind of an example of like a stylized for backlog. Okay, we talked about this a little bit already, I think. But basically, there's this stuff in your to-do column okay, for the sprint. There's the stuff in the doing column that's stuff actively, literally being worked on, and then stuff that's done. Okay, make sense? Sometimes there will be other columns in there. Um, you know, waiting on external review is a really common one, you know, because you're done with it, but it's not actually done because you got to get somebody else to approve it. Um, there's also sometimes you'll also have a distinction between like actually to do, like actually ready for work, and then maybe another column of like stuff that isn't quite ready for whatever reason, like you're waiting for a piece of hardware to come in or something like that. So you, you think you're going to be able to do this sprint. But, it, but the, you know, the board that you're waiting for just hasn't arrived. Like you think it's supposed to be here tomorrow, kind of thing. So you might have some other columns in there. Um, you should agree to them as a team uh, and everyone should know what they mean, but these three are generally the most important ones. All right. Um, this first bullet I think is incredibly important. Um, you know, processes are, prone to failure, right? Because the problem is they're trying to manage humans. Humans are impossible to manage. So humans are inconsistent. Your process should tolerate that, okay? You need to change the process if your humans aren't fitting it well, not force them somehow into the process. It will generally not work. Uh, so Scrum is usually a good answer, um, but it's not always the right answer, despite many people telling you that it will be. Um, one of the things to consider, um, you know, what I was kind of saying about the Scrum Master may not be kind of like a real member of the team. It may be more like guidance. Um, I would recommend for these projects that you do a rotating Scrum Master model, work it out with your PM, uh, you know, if they plan to do that job or if they want one of you to do it. Um, but if you rotate it, then hopefully over the course of the semester, you'll all have at least a chance to kind of do it once. Um, because it's kind of interesting to be on that side of the fence, uh, you know, and it is, it is useful because uh, it'll also help you understand when you go meet a professional Scrum Master. Um, and again, you know, it ain't perfect. Don't expect it to be. Modify it as necessary, but the team better agree about your modifications, okay? Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, like we have 87 people here to help you. So please, you know, talk to us. There's me, there's Professor Miller, there's, um, you know, our two course assistants, there's Camilla and um, Drago. Uh, and then we also have like Ian Saucy, who's part of the Spark staff. We have your PMs. Uh, we have Greta, who's kind of the boss of the PMs. Uh, we have, um, if we get into data science at all, we also have Michelle, who's another member of the Spark staff. Um, so, we have a lot of support for you. So please ask for help if you need it. Uh, it doesn't have to be technical help. It could also be project help. It could be client management help, whatever. All right, questions? All right, cool. So the phase of work that you are in currently, right, is trying to figure out what exactly you're going to be doing. Uh, and so the first step is to try to understand the problem, okay? And this is where that problem statement comes in um, and how, we'll talk about it, I think it's on the, yeah, next slide. Um, so basically problem statement should encapsulate what you think the general driving force problem that you're trying to solve for this semester not for the project itself, okay? So um, the uh, lesson, the French uh, speaking one, like, um, you know, teach everyone French with good pronunciation is not the problem statement, okay? The problem statement is, what are you trying to accomplish this semester? Okay, so just try to keep the scope to something reasonable. Um, 
All right, so the reason you're doing this, right, is because if you have kind of that problem statement or problem definition, as they call it here, um, all this stuff stacks on top of it. So if you if you have a problem statement that you know kind of talks about a scope that looks like you know this, if you get a requirement that's way over here, you can say it doesn't really fit what we're trying to accomplish here. Let's stick it in the product backlog and ignore it for a while. Okay. Um, and then in kind of like what what you're doing here is it kind of gets smaller and smaller as it goes up because you're you're kind of taking this broadish problem statement, then you're narrowing it into pieces of requirements, then you're trying to build like a technical architecture that will support it, and then code and then uh, you know testing, etc. But basically it's like you're trying to get to the point of the actual application. Does that make sense? This graphic is kind of it's on the fence of being useful. Um, but I think I still think it's useful, but it's kind of hard. Um, so going by way of problem statements, uh, this is not uncommon, very likely a true story. Um, but basically, so this computer had to be rebooted um, whenever it froze. So the way they fixed it, they took an old CD drive um, and put it in such a way that the CD drive, which came out of the computer, would hit the power button. Okay, um, so as scary as it is, it would not surprise me if this is a story from the New York Stock Exchange. Like, this is not an uncommon problem where you have very interesting solutions. But the, what you're really looking for, why we're talking about this, is because what the, the problem here, right, is the software or whatever that's making that machine for use, right? You misidentified the problem by just turning it off and on again every time it freezes. So that's the other part of the kind of problem statement, is it, especially if you're doing it as a collective, um, that it hopefully helps you all come to a better understanding of what you're actually trying to build um, and that you all agree on what you're trying to build. All right, this isn't really a quiz. Well, it is a quiz, but come on, don't break on me. Sweet. All right, so top hat question. What are some benefits of user stories? So you should have done a reading. It would have been, I think it was actually targeted to be for last lecture. So hopefully you did the reading and you will be able to get these answers correct. Well, I sip some more. Um, there is more than one correct answer, FYI. Or, sorry, you're supposed to be selecting all the correct answers, but it's not just one. We got a few more left. Come on. I hate any of you to feel like I asked to do the reading for no reason. So I figured doing stuff like this is uh, at least entertaining for me. All right, come on, one more. Let's go. Um, might just call it done. Uh, sometimes I think it. Oh no, it's finished. Um, oh, 
Okay, so just FYI, these are going to go into your like participation grade. Okay, um, what I want to do is make sure you're kind of doing the readings, that you're paying attention to the lectures, you know, that kind of stuff. So periodically, I'll pull out some questions like these, and that's kind of how I'll I'll be uh, getting at least a portion of the participation grade. So don't worry too much about them, but it's nice if you could do well on them. Um, can anybody? Tell me why this is wrong. Not really testing the software. But... Yeah, so it's kind of the other end of the problem. So the user stories are kind of what's feeding what you want to build, right? Um, so what's funny about this one is that if you use uh, business driven development, um, it actually is related, but we'll get into that some other time, maybe. Um, but yeah, so there's this is another one of those things where um, it's a little on the buzzwordy side, and so it makes it really popular, and so people ascribe a lot of benefit to it, which may or may not be 100% true. But user stories really do help understand uh, how you approach a problem um, or how you articulate the problem, because the temptation when you're doing any kind of requirements gathering is to uh, kind of tell the person who's giving you the required or for them to tell you really what the solution is and even and just as bad almost is when you tell another engineer what the solution is when what you want to tell them is the problem okay you want to tell them what are we trying to accomplish because unless you're doing it yourself you don't really care how they provide that feature to the users okay and it's very 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 difficult to get that mindset I still struggle with it today. Okay. Like it's very, very hard. And so a bunch of the tools in that we're talking about kind of help guide you into doing the right thing. Um, you know, I still manage to write user stories that tell exactly what I expect to have happen, but it's hopefully helps. All right. Another question. All right, final answers. It's very, very difficult to stand up here and do nothing. <laughs> All right, cool. Looks like everybody's in. And so, so there's definitely some misses on this one. Um, you know, what we're talking about is like validating a user story, right? Or testing the user story. So it's it's just a couple of these things, if you know what I mean. So I wouldn't say this is necessarily mission critical for you to remember, but I will say if you're not sure of some of these answers, it might be worthwhile rereading some of that because you're going to be writing a whole bunch of user stories. Uh, and it's like many people find it quite difficult uh when they first start doing it um it's really weird because once you start to get pretty good at it uh it's it, they seem at least everyone i've ever known right is like always thought they're pretty easy once you can kind of come up with the what you want to say but to start with people really struggle with it so usually it's like i don't know maybe it's like riding a bike kind of thing it's like 
kind of hard to get the hang of, but once you get the hang of it, it's easy. So hopefully your experience will be the same. All right, so back to our uh, regularly scheduled programming. Um, so some of this I talked about already, already but what makes a good problem statement? Um, and so doesn't propose a solution. Like I said, very hard thing to write. Is user centric, so it should be in terms of what is this? What do, what do you want to enable this person to do? Um, and when I say person, I actually mean persona. Does anybody know what the word persona means? Yeah, so it's almost like a stereotype, um, but in like a positive sense. So, but it's basically like if you can try to like manufacture a fake person who looks like the kind, not look, but looks like the kind of person who might be using that aspect of your software, it can be a really good reference point for the whole team. So people will actually make up names and give them pictures and like a whole nine yards, because then, especially if you have a long running product, then you can say, oh, you know, uh, Jill, uh, you know, th this is a Jill feature, right? Um, and stuff like that, and everybody knows what you mean. Um, and, uh, yeah, so often harkens back to the root cause. You know, why are you doing this? Um, I wish I had a better slide for this, but whatever. Um, so, problem statement is basically what you're, you know, it's kind of the foundation of all the other things that you're going to write. Um, and what I would like to do is with the problem statement submission is, you know, you don't do it as a group uh, and, and submit a group problem statement. However, feel free to ask for some level of review in advance, but it does mean you have to do it in advance. So, um, I feel like this is the, sorry, this is not, okay, this, this is the wrong title. I don't know why. Um, this is what makes a good user story. Sorry, uh, I, don't, I can't figure out why this is it. But so when we talk about those personas, um, and this one was largely about that too. Um, this is really what's what's hard here, and why I got confused on this slide is because a lot of the principles for a good problem statement and user story are very much the same. Um, but this is actually supposed to be talking about a user story. So a user story has always this format, okay? So as a whatever persona, um, I want to accomplish something um, so that I can do something else. This part is often the hardest part to write. So as Sasha, so that's the persona we created. So this person, and we would be able to look up Sasha um, to say, okay, this is a, you know, uh, Let's say it's, um, I can't think of any good example, but you know, it's a persona. So, you know, they have certain characteristics about them, but they want to organize their work so I can feel more in control. Okay. So maybe you came up with Trello as your, you know, kind of trick, start to be a solution for this. Um, as a manager, I want to be able to uh, understand my colleagues' progress so I can better report our success and failures. And so this one in particular is, is why that so that part is so important. Okay, because I want to understand my colleagues' progress. That can mean a lot of different things, right? Because it could be just, I need a gut check, are you making any progress, right? Or I need to know when you're going to be done, or I need to know whatever. But in this case, it's actually, they want to, they actually want to help the team on reporting their success and failures. So you need a, like hard numbers that you can kind of bubble up through management or something like that. So. That's why this part can be so important. And it, it's, it's, so it's not only kind of critical, but also I find relatively difficult to write or to remember to write. Does that make sense? Okay, so one of the things that is a challenge in like the software that you'll be working on this semester but then like in consulting in general, um, or whenever you enter a new industry is uh, basically context, okay? Um, 
it really, really, really helps if you can get some, like it says here, cursory domain understanding. So get an idea of whatever it is the business that you know you need to do the software for does. Um, go read about it on Wikipedia, you know, go read some vertical stuff, go, you know, go find a podcast about it, something like that, just to give you a flavor of what the kinds of people, the things people do in that industry, um, because it really will make a difference. Um, and so getting some understanding of the domain, reading uh, both about the domain, but also like about what else is going on in that project or in that uh, you know, or in that organization that you're doing the software for. Um, <clears throat> and then experiential learning can also be super useful uh, where you can actually like experiment with the things that they're working on. And so, um, and I say about beware just because you can get, you know, this is where you fall into that pit and you're like, oh my God, I'm so into this. But then, you know, 16 hours later, you're like, oh, I just wasted a lot of time. Um, but also you can break things. So be very careful when you're messing with uh, the you know applications or whatever that are in the you know in production at whatever company you're at. Um, but looking at them directly can make a big difference to your understanding of what the software does. Um, and then this keeps appearing here because that's one of the hardest things is um, whenever you're meeting with people who are trying to give you some kind of requirements. It's very hard to not just, you just have to shut up and listen, okay? So listen to what they're saying. Don't put words in their mouth. Don't put solutions in their mouth. Don't let them put solutions in their mouth. And doing that not rudely is, uh, you know, a learned skill that you'll get over time, but um, it's, it's really, really important that you listen to the people who are talking and making sure that they're telling you what their problems are, not what the solutions are. All right. Um, does anybody know what the word elicitation means? It means, yeah, so it's like extract, but nicer. Um, so, uh, but the, the technical term often is requirements elicitation, uh, because what you're, what you're trying to imply, right, is that it's not requirements gathering, right? It's what you're coaxing out of them about what the goal is, uh, rather than, you know, it's just lying there and you can just pick it up. Does that make sense? Um, and so how do you do this? And how do you know when you did it well? So basically there's not a whole lot you can do besides talk to people. Um, some applications, some requirements, that kind of stuff, can be more obvious from the like market they're in um, that you can just kind of pick up. But most of the time, what you want to do is talk to the various stakeholders. If possible, talking to users is really the best. Um, and you know, kind of talk about their day, talk about how they're using the software, what are they doing, or if the software doesn't exist yet, you know, talk about the problem that they're having and why are they having it and what you know, what kinds of you know paths might make it simpler or faster or whatever. Uh, and so that's kind of how you do it. And then how do we know we did it well? Well, you usually don't. This is why we put it in front of users as fast as humanly possible, okay? Because the only people who can tell us if we are actually delivering the software that is meeting the needs of the users is the users, okay? So how do you know? And then, I mean, there is some level um, of, you know, knowing you did a pretty good job in that, when when you're doing that conversation with clients and that kind of stuff, you put it into user stories, you put it into this product backlog, but then you give it back to them, right? And say, hey, can you take a look at this? You know, does, it, does this capture what we talked about? You know, what's missing? Are there things we should talk about some more? Is this not clear enough? Et cetera, okay? Um, and if you do anything as not a team, kind of the same is true for the team as well. So if I go into a client meeting, and I talk to them for you know, a couple hours and I come up with a bunch of stuff, I'm gonna put that all into the backlog and I'm gonna tell the rest of the team, please add to your list of things to do, look over what I got, just to get more feedback, more perspective. <sighs> all right. Um, and then kind of 
this we're also talking here a little bit about like in general, not necessarily specifically for these projects. Um, but when you're talking about certain kinds of projects, it can take a very long time and they must be very exact. Okay, so the example here is embedded systems that are like mission critical. So, you know, the black box in an airplane. Uh, let's make sure those requirements are written down carefully first um, and make sure they're actually going to do what we think they do because experimenting in the field is probably a bad idea. Um, however, there can be less obvious ones. So, for example, I worked on a project uh, for Pfizer uh, that was basically complaint collection. So, basically, anytime anyone had an adverse effect to a drug, the, a complaint would be filed. And complaint doesn't necessarily mean that they were complaining as much as like an adverse event happened. Um, usually filed by doctors, but could be anybody. Uh, every single one of those that was not kind of end up in the proper place essentially, uh, was a million dollar fine for Pfizer. Okay, so we were very careful about those requirements uh, to make sure we understood what exactly had to happen to it and why and when and all that stuff. Um, so that one, definitely not a mission critical embedded system, but generally speaking, people get annoyed if you drop something on the floor and they get fined a million dollars. Um, you know, same with like stock trading, right? So. Uh, I've worked on projects where a minute of downtime is literally min millions of dollars. Uh, so they don't like it when they have a minute of downtime. Um, yeah, and so the formality slides across the scale quite a bit. Uh, also can also happen with kind of like age of product. So if you're building something brand new, your requirements are going to be pretty squishy most of the time. And then as you get as you get more and more understanding of the project and the product and the, the users and that kind of stuff, they tend to get tighter and more focused. And you tend to have simpler new requirements than you did at the beginning. Um, I think I talked about this. Uh, oh, I, I did say this, but I didn't really kind of define it. Uh, does anybody know what a stakeholder is? Probably make an educated guess. So, ideas? Yeah. Well, I don't know exactly, but it's kind of weird because if the customer is the one who uses it, and we're the owners because we're the ones working on it and responsible for it, then I assume stakeholders are people that put resources into it to get the product owners to do things. So, the temptation regularly is to consider st stakeholders the people giving you the money. But that's not actually true. All the people you mentioned in that group are stakeholders, okay? Because there's the people who are working on the software, there's the people who are gonna use the software, there's the people who are paying for the software to get created. And when I say pay, I don't necessarily mean in necessarily real dollars, right? So the, you know, the customers you're working with, they're not like paying for your time per se, but they are in the sense of they're giving up their time, right? They may be paying for hardware in the cloud or something like that, but a lot of times the, the payment or the participation or whatever can very easily be time and time is, can be quite expensive for people. So one of the things that I think is very beneficial to a project is to literally write down the list of stakeholders that are involved. And when I say the list, I do not mean like organizations, I mean like names, okay? Because then, every call it sprint or whatever you can you know send them off a note to all the stakeholders you know you have pcc so that nobody so a lot of times the stakeholders don't get along um it says hey this is what we accomplished right don't you want to you know aren't you excited isn't that great and then hopefully what they do is they keep seeing you and they see progress and that kind of stuff and then they give you more money for more projects later okay um yeah, and uh, yeah, and the second bullet is also important. I'm not going to talk about it too much because I've kind of talked about it already. But this is where that going to solutions part is part of the problem. It's like get focused on the problem. Don't look at solutions. Don't look at what you think a user might need. Okay, go find out. Do they actually use it? Do they actually need it? Um, if you're not sure, um, maybe find a way, a cheap way to build a test such that you can find out. And this is actually, I really like this example. Um, there's a company uh, that, I blanked on the name for a second there, called Vistaprint. Um, and 
they were getting regular requests to sell their products and let people pay for them with checks. Okay. Um, they didn't do any check, you know, cashing or whatever. So like you had to pay with a credit card or let's just say credit card. I don't know what else. So what they did was they went and implemented, um, you know, a radio button that lets you say, okay, I'm going to pay by check. All right. And then if you clicked on that, it would take you to a new screen that said, oh, we're sorry, this is down right now. And discovered that no one ever got to that screen. So they never actually implemented it. They hadn't implemented it to begin with. They just put up a dummy screen that said, this is broken right now. Because they're like, we don't, we don't really believe the users want this. We think people just think they want it. And so they're asking for it. So why don't we put up a test and we'll just count the number of people who actually try to use checks. And it turned out to be zero. So they never built it. So there might be ways to get to that answer without actually building the software. Um, and it's kind of funny because it, it sounds like disingenuous, right? Except if you think about it, it really isn't. You know, they, they, it, it is down. It's really not working um, because they didn't write the code. <sighs> But yeah, I, I love that story. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, one thing that I like to point out because a lot of people don't kind of know this terminology, um, functional versus non-functional requirements. Um, I would say in software these days, these are this distinction is getting increasingly rare um, because of things like cloud and serverless and stuff like that, that Non-functional requirements are basically things like all logins must take less than a second. I'm just making up a number. But so it's a requirement that has nothing to do with the functionality of the application. It has to do with like performance or, um, you know, backup regularity or things like that. Um, so actually a really good example. Uh, so Red Hat, for example, uh, wanted to switch to Gmail for a while but operated in a bunch of company countries where if you have sensitive emails, they had to be stored in country. And so they wanted to switch to Gmail, but Google couldn't put, did not have a non-functional requirement that said data from this user will stay in this country. Does that make sense? Like you follow me? Like am I explaining that well? Maybe? Everybody's sleepy? All right. So that was a non-functional requirement. Google couldn't support it uh, for a long, long time. Um, and we're weirdly almost proud of it. It was very odd. Um, and so Red Hat had no option to go to Google for Gmail. Uh, eventually they changed that and now Red Hat used Gmail, but that was a great non-functional requirement example. <clears throat> um, you seem uh, perturbed. I was just wondering what it was before that. Simbra, open source. Um, open source exchange competitor. Why, for a really long time. why Gmail if it was open source? You can, you can ask me that in office hours or with cocktails. Um, you got it. Yeah, so let's see. Uh, except for this criteria. Uh, this one is slippery uh, because it goes by many, many names. But remember, we were kind of talking about the definition of done. Um, except this criteria is in the same vein. So it's you have completed this if it does these things. Okay, that's what the acceptance criteria should be. It's not passes all tests. It's literally like, I'm able to pay for stuff with a check. Okay, that's the kind of thing you're looking for for acceptance criteria. They will be optionally essentially added to a user story. So you'll kind of have the user story, then maybe you'll have like a longer description with the user story, maybe. Um, you know, maybe some links to other examples of how that user story was implemented elsewhere. Um, but then another thing might be a list of acceptance criteria that says, okay, we consider this complete if these things are true. Make sense? Uh, often, like I said, often called success criteria. I think the industry is pretty starting to really settle on acceptance criteria, but your mileage may vary. Um, all right. Another thing we want to talk about is, uh, and I've mentioned this word a bunch, uh, but who, who knows what I mean by say scope or scoping? Anyone? So it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's like the box around a product, okay? With software, 
the scope of the project is often very, very slippery. Okay, very hard to wrap your head around where exactly does this software stop and start? As in, like, what features does it need to have to be useful? Okay. And so, <laughs> excuse me. So we refer to a project's kind of size, we refer to it as its scope. And when things go out of scope, it means they're outside that box. Um, or something is in scope, it means it's inside that box. Does that make sense? So it can be very difficult to stay in the box. So as a result, the term and you know out of scope and all this stuff comes up a lot and is often a source of many arguments. Um, another related thing is what is politely referred to as evolving requirements, which is where the, you know, the user needs to be able to page die check um, is the requirement. And then, you know, a week later, it's like, oh, we don't actually care about checks. We got to be able to do credit cards. Oh, wait, we don't really care about that. We want to be able to do debit cards, right? So that's an evolving requirement. It's usually in the same vein. It's not quite a different thing. Um, but it's changing, so it means you're throwing away code or writing a bunch of new code that was not in the original scope. Okay, and scope can be in a lot of different levels. You can have a project scope, but you can have a requirement scope as well. <clears throat> um, this is usually referred to as the 80 20 rule. You will probably hear me say this a lot. One of the difficult things about doing software development is thinking that you will actually be able to build things well, okay? You probably will be able to build things okay, sometimes better than okay, but probably not well, okay? As in, you're probably gonna be able to satisfy 80% of the requirements. Um, and with basically 20% of the work is the way the joke usually goes. So 80% of the requirements, 20% of the work, then 20% of the requirements, 80% of the work. So it's often important to recognize is the, you know, is this last requirement worth the amount of effort it's probably going to take? Okay. Because it, it can be difficult to determine upfront that something is like that. Um, but so the 80 20 rule, kind of talking about that in terms of requirements, this bullet is specifically talking about um, when you're looking at a project. You know, you're trying to find 80% of your requirements. Once you get there, just kind of stop, okay, and let the rest of it evolve. And then budget for 20% of the requirements for that first frame to kind of move off from there. But this 80 20 thing kind of comes up a lot where you kind of talk about like, get to good enough is often fine, then kind of take a step, right? Do whatever that is, whether it's a sprint, a set of work, a, you know, uh, requirements gathering, whatever, move to the next step and then see what's left rather than try for this mythical 100%. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, I kind of explained this not great, but so, so yeah, these bullets, this bullet is not the one I was thinking of. Um, but so kind of the idea here is that you, you know, if the project is complex, so like an embedded system, you know, whatever, um, or really ill-defined or whatever, um, getting more of the requirements is probably a good idea. If it's either straightforward or simpler or whatever, getting less requirements up front and building and putting in front of users is way more important than it is to get good requirements. I think I made that mistake with this slide before. When I've presented it before. Um, and then this last part is that evolving requirements thing. So, how do you deal with constant change? Um, this is a forever complexity, but basically, the trick is usually write things down, right? Is that when you come up with that user story, identify what it is, write it down, get, you know, the client to sign off. In other words, like get them to review it make sure they understand it, make sure they're given their feedback. Um, and when they're trying to change it, talk about it uh, and recognize it as a new thing, new piece of work, instead of just adding it on to the existing one. Make it a new piece of work and let them prioritize it individually. 
All right, these slides are boring. Uh, I'm gonna skip that one. Oh, might have been the last one. Oh, sweet. All right, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, this is basically what I just said. Um, all right, so yeah, I just would kind of say, like giving requirements, gathering advice is very, very difficult because it is really kind of like it happens in conversation. But the big tricks are listen to the people talking, right? Don't put words in their mouth. Don't let them put words in their own mouth, like as in don't let them provide solutions. Make sure that you get as many perspectives on the requirements that you collect as you possibly can. Okay, so both back to the client, your teammates, you know, project manager, um, you know, and and you know, because you'll you'll get different perspectives, you'll get different data, you'll get more refined requirements. Um, don't expect that the requirements you gather at the beginning will be complete. Okay, so expect it and build for it. Okay, so personally, I like to almost like get the problem statement and like a few user stories about what we're trying to accomplish, then build that and deploy it and get it out to at least the stakeholders, if not actual users, so that they so that we're all on the same page. And then just iterate like that. Um, in fact, in the next probably a couple of weeks, we're going to have you all deploy the first version of your product. Okay. Even though it's going to have like it's going to be the same as the landing page for the assessment. It's going to be like, it works, right? But what I want you to do is I want you to have a pipeline that deploys and does all the stuff because I want, as soon as you write a lick of code, when you, when you push it to GitHub or whatever, it'll show up as working application. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Like I said, this is, this is a hard lecture for me to give. So uh, I apologize if it's not awesome. Um, but any questions? All right, cool. Uh, reminder on the announcements. Um, 